Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, webinar Bioplastics in Your Daily Life. Uh, this is hosted by the Dutch and Nordic hubs of the Bloom project. My name is Maarten Koetstra and I work at Wageningen Food and Bio-Based Research and I will be your moderator for today. And it's nice to see so many of you registering for today's webinar. I see we are up to nearly 50 participants right now. Very good. Um, today's session will be recorded, just to let you know, so you can uh, watch it again at your convenience at a later date. So, um, today's webinar is part of a series called uh, Bioeconomy in, in Our Daily Lives, and it is organized within the Bloom Project, which is a uh, European-funded project, and the um, acronym stands for Boosting European Citizens' Knowledge and Awareness of Bioeconomy Research and Innovation. Um, if you'd like to visit the website, please do so. The link to this website will be provided in the chat. And just to give you some little bit more, a little bit more background. Um, oh, sorry. Across uh, Europe, five regional hubs have been established to inform the general public on the subject of uh, bioeconomy and to create a space for uh, information exchange and debate. And the focus of each of the hubs um, is typical for that region. So uh, the goal is to engage the general public by facilitating collaboration between citizens and, um, for example, policymakers, uh, education institutes, science communication networks, um, researchers, industry, and media, of course, through a series of uh, workshops and other outreach activities. Um, and additionally, uh, 10 schools, I'm sorry, schools in 10 countries uh, are involved and they work on how to um, integrate uh, bioeconomy lessons into their uh, schooling systems. This is just to get to know each other a little bit or to know a little bit more about who is attending. So if you kindly go to menti.com right now and then you can use the code at the screen here, which is a 93. 45137. This will also be in the chat uh, if you need it. And you can there answer three very short questions. And the answers of those questions will appear for all of us uh, on the screen. So when, then we can uh, find, it, find out a bit more about who we all are. So first question is, where are you from? So let's see what, uh, what will appear there. Ah, let's see. Well, this is interesting. Things are changing as we speak. Lots of people from Finland, Austria, Spain. Oh my God, it's changing. Netherlands. Some from outside of Europe. Very interesting. Some welcome to the people from Ethiopia, India, Nepal even. It's going too fast to, for me to follow. <laughs> Well, welcome to everybody, of course. The second question um, regards your background, or I think the wording is, what part of society do you come from? Let's see, we have um, a lot of students and um, a lot of people from the scientific community. And the others are a bit harder to read. Let's see what I can, media, communication, civil society, policymakers. Well, students and scientific background are very well represented, but it's nice to see uh, people from other areas also getting involved. The last question is, what uh, are your first three associations with uh, the term bioplastics? Uh, let's see, what do we have? Uh, sustainability, biomass, uh, bioeconomy. Those are the main ones, and we have a, a lot of smaller ones. Future, I see. Uh, biotech, chemistry, circular, teach at school, that's a nice one. Biodegradable, that's always interesting. Okay, well, very interesting indeed. I think I uh, will reshare my screen now. 
Uh, let's see, the program of the, of, uh, the webinar today uh, will be as follows. Uh, we will have three panelists that will present and each of them will have 10 minutes for their presentation. This will be followed by a, a panel discussion of um, around 25 minutes. And uh, we would uh, like to ask all the attendees, please feel free to ask questions in the chat section for a specific panelist or maybe for all of them, or just if you would like uh, the panelists to comment on something, um, please go right ahead and just remember there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, and another thing is that uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you can afterwards, after the webinar, uh, fill in an evaluation form for us. Uh, you can do so via the link that uh, is uh, at the screen right now and which will also be in the chat. Now, just to give you a little bit of an idea of who we are, uh, the webinar is um, uh, organized by this, uh, this Bloom team of today, uh, which uh, is a collaboration of the Dutch and Nordic hubs. The Dutch people are at the top here, and from left to right, it's uh, Harriette, myself, uh, Pauline, and Remco. And uh, below are Kirsty, Annemarie, Tarja, and Lotta. And uh, everybody has uh, put in quite a lot of effort to get, uh, to get the webinar uh, running. And most also contrib contribute today. So Harriet as a panelist, uh, myself as a moderator, but uh, the other people are busy behind the screens uh, uh, to make uh, everything run smoothly. So thanks to all. So let's get to the core of today's webinar. Uh, the presentations. Um, the presenters are Harriet de Bos, uh, Virpi uh, Koronen, and, and Rudy Volkersma. Um, let's see, um, we can start from the left. And again, I remind you, please ask questions in the chat. So, Harriet uh, Bos. Harriet, uh, Bos. Harriet works at uh, Wageningen Food and Bio-Based Research, and she has many roles there. Just to name two on the top of my head, uh, she's a program manager and also a expertise leader. And uh, she focuses on two subjects mainly. Firstly, um, renewable materials such as uh, bioplastics and textiles. And secondly, uh, sustainability and systems issues uh, with regard to the circular bioeconomy. Um, the subject of the, her presentation today is uh, bioplastics in the circular bioeconomy. Uh, Harriet, are you there? Yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Welcome. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. If I stop sharing my screen, you can start sharing yours. Yes, let. Okay, so it's working. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Harriet Bos, and uh, um, I'm working for the Wageningen Research. So actually, I'm a, a colleague of Martin, and I'm going to tell you something about bioplastics and circular bioeconomy in the next ten minutes. Um, bioplastics generally are plant-based products and they are renewable and the fact that they are renewable enables them to be play a part in the circular production processes uh, in the circular bioeconomy. Um, plant-based materials or bioplastics can replace fossil-based materials and by that they can help reduce the greenhouse gas emissions uh, to, to fight climate change. So this very brief introduction, I uh, introduced the three concepts, renewable resources, replacing fossil based materials and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the next couple of minutes, we are going to look deeper into these uh, three different uh, concepts. So starting with renewable resources, renewable resources, we also call biomass and they form the basis of the bioeconomy. Now, biomass comes in very different kind of forms. They can be crops, side streams, wood, marine sources, etc., etc. But what is important to uh, remember also for the next of the presentation is that the most important atom in these sources is the carbon atom. And we also call it C. So carbon C is most important atom in these sources. Um, Lene Lange from Denmark, she has made a very nice uh, presentation of uh, what biomass all comprises and she gives some colors. Uh, you can look it up later, as Martin already said, we are recording this uh, webinar, so you can uh, look up the different, all the different sources of the biomass. Um, looking into the biomass, 
generally uh, it contains only eight different uh, components. So if you look at a tree, a tree is made up of cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. Uh, and many of the other uh, crops, for instance, they contain proteins, oils, fats, starch, sugars and specialty ingredients. And these last five, they are important for our food, so what we eat every day. So what we do with this biomass, of course we eat it, so we use it as food. Uh, we can feed it to our animals, uh, we can produce energy out of it, but we can also make materials and we can turn them into chemical building blocks by breaking them down. And I will go deep, more deep into that uh, discussion later. So materials and chemical building blocks are the non-food applications of biomass. And of course, the use of renewable resources for non-food applications is all this humanity. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, 5000 BC there already was flax grown to produce linen from. Uh, but even today, when you look around, many of the glues that we use are still made from renewable resources. Uh, the tires on your car are partly based on natural rubber, etc., etc. But um, when we look around, what we also see is that um, some new materials and new products have entered the market uh, the last 25 years. Um, for instance, um, when you have a car and you take it apart, there are many panels in your car that actually contain natural fibers in combination with a polymer or with a bioplastic. Um, and what we have seen also is that especially the bioplastics, they have entered um, the, the, um, the, the packaging markets, etc. Um, but often they, are, they look so similar to the normal plastics that you won't even know that they are actually bioplastics. So they are used for all kinds of products, but also for fibers, etc., etc. Now, they look very much like normal plastic, so they replace normal plastic. So we're not going to talk about replacing fossil-based materials. How does that work? Um, fossil-based materials are made from crude oil. And uh, crude oil contains, again, this carbon atom, C. So what happens? Um, crude oil is pumped up and about 95% of it is used for fuels, for our transport, for cars, etc. And 5% is a side stream, which we call NAFTA. And this NAFTA is made up of very small molecules made from carbon. So we have the ethylene, which is made from two carbon atoms, propylene three, butadiene four. And we have an aromatic fraction with molecules like benzene, toluene, xylene, etc. And what the chemical industry does, they actually add some other atoms and they uh, polymerize these uh, original six uh, platform chemicals together in order to make all the plastics that we know that we use every day around us. So the question is, can we do the same thing from biomass? And yes, we can make the same materials from biomass via the approach of building blocks. So what we do, we break the bi biomass down into small molecules and then we re rebuild it into uh, um, bioplastics. Um, we wrote a really nice booklet about that. It is available here through groenstof.nl um, and it shows uh, the number of routes that you can take from biomass to actually produce um, bioplastics. Um, you can produce exactly the same bioplast of the same plastics as we make from fossil uh, feedstock. So you can make PET like from the PET bottles or PE like for the, for the plastic bags. But you can also make new materials like PEF, which is similar to PET, but also polylactic acid, which is entering the market in many different applications. Now, are these bioplastics always biodegradable? No, they are not. Because if you make a bioplastic, which is exactly the same as the fossil-based plastic, so if you make a bio-PET, it will, just like the fossil-based PET, not be biodegradable. Um, but you can, of course, recycle it together with the fossil-based PET or together with the other bio-based PET. Same counts for PE. And we will go into recycling somewhat later in the presentation. Actually, some of the fossil-based uh, materials are biodegradable. So biodegradability and bio-based is not necessarily the same thing. And of course, there is a whole bunch of materials which are and bio-based, and they are biodegradable, like the polylactic acids, the starch blends, etc., etc. Um, so as I already said, many bioplastics are, are entering the market, and probably you will not even know that it's a bioplastic because it's so similar to the, uh, the plastics that we are used to. A question that is often asked uh, is how much land will these bioplastics use? And this is a graph from European Bioplastics. 
Uh, and here we see um, the, uh, what we use our agricultural area globally for, um, um, uh, yeah, what, what we use it for. So most of it is used as pasture for feeding uh, cows and sheep, etc. About 20%, 25% is used for agriculture to produce food and feed. And at present only uh, 0.16, or maybe it's now 0.18% is used for the production of bioplastics. Now, of course, this uh, amount will go up when we are going to use more and more bioplastics, but it will still remain quite small compared to, um, uh, to the agricultural use of land. Uh, on the other hand, because the amount will go up, it's also important to recycle all the materials that we have as much as possible. And this brings us to our last subject, uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. How does this work? Um, we have a plant and the plant grows and it takes up CO2 out of the atmosphere and builds it into its tissue. Um, from the tissue we make uh, food uh, and we can make a product like a plastic bottle from a bio PET for instance. And the bottle we can recycle as often as possible until it's, uh, the material has really degraded. After recycling uh, you can either, uh, either biodegrade it or burn it. Um, and just as with the food after we've eaten it, uh, the CO2 is released again into the atmosphere. But this CO2 can then be taken up by the plant again and to make new, uh, new tissue and make new food and new materials. And this is really different from what you do when you take fossil feedstock out of the ground, you pump up the oil, you make a material uh, like a plastic, and even if you recycle it 20 times, the 21st time it will still be burned or, or, uh, or degraded and the CO2 will enter the atmosphere and this will add additional CO2. So this will actually add additional greenhouse gas effect to the atmosphere. Two minutes. So sorry. yes, a binding C uh, is, is, is very important. So what we want to do, we want to keep C carbon in the system as long as possible. And as I already explained, biomass is a source of renewable carbon but also the plastics that the carbon that contain the carbon, they are a source of renewable carbon. So they can be either normal plastics or bioplastics, but what we have to do is we have to recycle them. And there are a couple of different approaches towards recycling. Uh, of course, we can reuse the, the product, so we can just use the product again. Uh, you have a bottle, you reuse the bottle. Um, you can do mechanical recycling and that is what's done a lot in, in the present facilities. So you collect and you sort uh, the plastic material or the bioplastic material with it. You remelt it and then you produce a new product. And then we have the last kind of recycling, which is chemical recycling, which is something that is in development presently. Again, you collect, you sort it, and then you break down the plastic in a chemical way towards the building blocks that were also used in the first uh, instance to produce all these plastics. You repolymerize them and then you reprocess them. And the advantage of this is that actually you can make much better material with much better properties if you uh, use this approach. Um, but as I said, this is still in, in development. So the role of bioplastics in the circular bioeconomy summing up it is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions through the use of renewable carbon. Uh, renewable carbon comes from biomass, but it also comes from recycling. So it's important to do both thing things at the same time. And we are talking about replacing fossil products and fossil products are especially plastics and also textiles uh, where fossil um, um, uh, plastics are, are used in. Um, so this sums up um, the role of bioplastics in the circular economy and thank you for your attention. Thank you Harriet. It's a lot of information and I'm sure uh, questions will be uh, will be asked in the chat. Shall we quickly uh, go to the next uh, presenter? The next presenter is uh, Virpi Koronen. Uh, Virpi works at the, uh, at the Finnish community called New Woods and she is the executive director. Um, in this role, she promotes the uh, wood-based bioeconomy uh, by providing information to influencers and politicians about the significance and the value of wood-based uh, products. Uh, Virpi, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. And I will uh, unshare my screen and then yes. you can share yours. So the, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Good. Okay. Yes. So good. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, as was mentioned, I'm I come from the new boot uh, project uh, and representing around twenty organizations uh, who are our member companies uh, and represent the entire value chain of wood. Uh, in Finland, uh, three out of ten most important export goods are made from wood and almost a quarter of the value of Finnish exports come from wood products. So in that sense, wood is very important for our economy. So the task of our project is to tell our audience why wood is a sustainable material to replace fossil based uh, materials. Uh, we maintain a new wood exhibition that demonstrates the new wood based products and solutions Contain, containing more than 50 different products and solutions made of wood. Uh, Finland has a long tradition of using wood responsibly. Uh, smart and systematic forestry practices will ensure sufficient resources also in the future. 90% of uh, our forests are PEFC certified and two thirds of our forests are owned by families and private people. And thanks to the rec recyclability, wood fiber based materials remain valuable raw materials even after use. The recycling degree of fiber based materials is higher than 100% as the, as the statistics cannot report all the packaging uh, with imported goods. On the following slides, I will present some products and solutions to replace fossil based plastics. Uh, the Finnish company Lapset Group is one of the leading manufacturers of playground and sport park equipment worldwide. The Angry Birds figures of the of this playground equipment are made of Ax Absorbex eco craft paper manufactured by Finnish Kotka Mills. The raw materials for the craft paper are recycled fiber pulp with pulp made from sawdust. This is a recycling bin for a thousand plastic free coffee, coffee cups. Uh, the used paper cups placed in the recycling bin are stacked avoiding the cup chaos that would result if they were thrown into a regular rubbish bin. A container full of used plastic-free cups can be pulped as such as there is no plastic content in any of the materials. This tray is manufactured by a Finnish company called Jospak. The tray is formed from from recyclable corrugated board and it helps to reduce the amount of plastics up to 85 percent. It, it is material efficient and distinctive as the brand and product information can be printed directly to the tray. Uh, the Jospak tray is compatible with existing automatic packaging process uh, in the food industry it can be applied to diverse food products, also in modified atmosphere packaging. The use of the plastic film on the tray uh, can be separated by hand. And this picture demonstrates how you can separate the plastic layer uh, of, the, of the tray after use. And the tray can be also printed inside. A lot of bubble wrap and expanded polystyrene are used both in consumer and postal packaging. Uh, for these materials, however, viable recycling options are rare. From consumers' perspective, expanded polystyrene is also difficult to due to the large amount of space it takes after use. Uh, 
A light foam structure made from wood fiber uh, works just as well uh, as the packaging solutions in use. Uh, this fiber foam is adaptable to paper and cardboard recycling and is made from renewable raw materials. This is another concept um, uh, for um, uh, online shopping. It's called elastic cardboard. It offers a new, more durable and aesthetic alternative to bubble wrap. Uh, it has an elastic inner part of the package made of corrugated cardboard, with, which bends well for packaging different mm -hmm. types of products. And uh, thanks to the, its innovative design, the inside of the package keeps the product in place during transport. Uh, wood composites have become a popular material for uh, re replacing the use of plastics. The carbon footprint of the composite can be 85% lower than of traditional plastics. And in this picture you can see, or slide, you can see a wash bin uh, and a chair and some um, cosmetic packaging made of wood composite. And all of these products are of high end or for high end uh, use. Woodley uh, was the last winner of our new wood competition that we run every two years in Finland. Their product is a carbon neutral packaging material to, repair, to replace traditional plastics. Woodley products can uh, be made with the same machinery as than plastics and they offer different grades for different targets of use. Uh, this figure presents Finnish consumers' perceptions of bio-based plastics. You can see that in many respects uh, it's similar uh, to carbon, carbon board and paper, so quite positive actually. Uh, here, for example, these are the bars for bio-based plastics, carbon board and paper. You can see that it's perceived environmentally friendly, safe uh, and as natural as carbon board and paper. It's also considered uh, even more modern than the carbon board and plastics. So in this sense, uh, actually we didn't run, uh, run bio-based uh, in this survey earlier than when we conducted the same study 10 years ago and five years ago, but we only included it now and we were quite uh, surprised by the, by the positive image of bio-based plastics. But um, at the same time, we noticed that many people have quite a lot of misconceptions about for example, biodegradability of bio-based plastics. So lots of um, information need, needs to be shared with consumers uh, if bio-based uh, plastics are applied uh, on different applications. Two minutes, Vipi. Yeah, I'm actually finishing now. So there are many reasons, uh, good reasons to prefer wood. So the wood-based bioeconomy, actually it re represents high-tech uh, in the 2020s and uh, these businesses um, applying wood um, um, and uh, based on sustainable, using sustainable raw materials will solve uh, global problems and they will also succeed in the future. And, uh, the development and manufacture of wood-based products uh, creates well-being for all. So actually uh, using wood, it employs in, in those parts of, of our country, for example, that no other jobs are available. So in that sense, it's also beneficial for, for our uh, economy. And that was my pre presentation. Thank you. And you can find all these solutions and much more at musipu.fi.
Thank you, Virpi. That was very interesting indeed. And apart from the, all the information, I have to say it's absolutely stunning pictures that you have used in your... Uh, oh, thank you. Now, let's see. I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, just a uh, quick reminder for people that are uh, listening or watching um, to pose your questions in the chat. Just feel free to do so. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Rudy Volkersma. Um, Rudy works at the NHL Stenden University of Applied Science. He is a professor in uh, sustainable uh, polymer technologies and recycling of plastics. And NHL Stenden is an uh, educational partner in the bio-based and circular plastic cluster in Emmen in the Netherlands. The subject of his presentation today is uh, bioplastics, the regional approach of the uh, Dutch hub in Emmen. Rudy, are you present? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, we welcome you here. Huh? I will uh, stop sharing my screen and you can share yours. Then the floor is yours and go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, so I will focus on uh, plastics, bioplastics uh, in the northern part of the Netherlands. I will show you some examples of um, projects we are doing together with companies. So like Martin already said, I'm representing NHL Stenden University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I'm actually involved in two professorships, one in the field of circular plastics and one in the field of sustainable polymers. And I'm a project leader in uh, a center of expertise we call GreenPack. And actually GreenPack is uh, the link between knowledge institutes and companies. So we do applied research using bachelor students, master students, PhDs uh, to do this uh, applied research with the companies. Small introduction of our university. So although we are regional in the northern part of the Netherlands, we have five campus sites there. We also have some small campus sites uh, worldwide. So that's in South Africa, in Qatar, in Thailand, in Indonesia. Um, actually, we are an international uh, university of applied science. We have 15% of the students uh, having an international uh, background and we cover around 19 different nationalities. So, focusing on the northern part of the Netherlands, we ha actually have three universities of applied science and what we call a more traditional or classical university, that's the University of Groningen. And we all cooperate in all kinds of projects, ranging from uh, the bio-based economy to more uh, circularity, uh, like Harriet already mentioned, uh, the recycling of plastics. So when you look at the left part, you can see a map of the northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, you can see on the map Emmen, that's where I am located. Um, besides our university, we have a big industry park over there uh, containing many um, plastic producing companies uh, over there. Del Sal uh, in the north is a, is a harbor actually, but also industry more uh, focusing on uh, the building blocks we use for our uh, polymers. Groningen, of course, uh, university. Mm, we also have some uh, companies, um, recyclers, uh, Heerenveen, Weister, and in Leeuwarden we have some facilities in the field of mechanical recycling and chemical uh, recycling. Uh, so, also uh, the focus on my talk will be the cooperation between all these companies and knowledge institutes, sharing facilities, for instance. So looking at our research, actually when you see the butterfly model of Ellen MacArthur, you can see uh, a biological loop and a technical loop. I will focus on the biological loop with regard to plastics. And then we are focusing on, on a few research lines. Uh, re 3D printing, uh, biopolymers in general, yarns and fibers and biocomposite materials. Also, we are involved in another professorship um, and it's more about circular plastics. So the technical loop. 
So green pack, like I said, um, cooperation with knowledge institutes and companies. Um, it's a problem application center. Um, many parties involved over there. And well, let's give some examples of the things we are doing. First of all, we share facilities. So on the left side, you see our uh, engineering plastic laboratory, uh, injection molding machines, extrusion machines, uh, testing facilities uh, to obtain the mechanical properties of polymers. We share facilities with Sanders laboratories on our industry campus where our students can do all kinds of research. We have a more chemical laboratory um, to do analysis of the polymers and we have a lab laboratory for uh, prototyping uh, new products. So some focus areas, uh, the bio-based polymers, um, well, a well-known one is PLA. Actually, we're doing research on the applications of PLA for all domestic appliances. But we also make blends of PLA with other biopolymers like PBS or PHA. And we try to get some information about the parameters involved in the biodegradation bio process. So how can we uh, modify these parameters and then well obtain products with maybe degrade in three months or six months or in a year. So how can we, yes, make products in which we can mm, tune the biodegradation behavior. And also we apply PLA in combination with natural fibers like hemp or flax or jute and look at the mechanical properties, but also at the uh, biodegradation properties. And actually that's the same for PHAs. We are involved in a big project together with the University of Groningen in which we study uh, PHAs. PHAs is, a very, PHAs is a very promising material. Actually, it's, uh, PHA is the name of a combination of uh, all kinds of polyhydroxinate alkanoates. Uh, but this m promising material is a little expensive, maybe three or four times more than the normal commodity uh, plastics. Uh, and actually, this high price is reflected in the way it's produced. So. How can we optimize the synthesis of these PHAs? We do a study together with the University of Groningen and actually it's the synthesis, but also the extraction of PHA out of these bacteria. How can we optimize it? And once we did it, uh, we do uh, some research in the application of PHAs. So for domestic appliances, maybe also in combination with other biopolymers. So we make plants out of it uh, also adding uh, natural fibers and see what application possibilities are for these materials. Also 3D printing. So we produce our own monofilaments for 3D printing. And this method shown here is the FDM method. Um, we add all kinds of additives, natural uh, bio-based additives, colorants, and see if we can make a nice 3D product out of it. And like I said before, all these projects we do, we do together with students. So chemistry students or mechanical engineering students, uh, they are involved in these projects together with the companies. Another way of 3D printing is SLA. So actually you have a resin and using UV light, you can also uh, produce 3D prints. And our focus in this field actually uh, are two research areas. One is renewable resins, uh, maybe modify them and then make 3D prints out of it. And a new research line are the so-called fight remers. Actually, these are uh, thermoset materials, but they can also behave in a thermoplastic way. So actually they are recyclable. It's a reverse process going from a thermoplastic to a thermal set and back to a thermoplastic behavior. And these kinds of resins we use are also bio-based, modify, and then uh, make a 3D print out of it. Very promising uh, new area in the field of 3D printing. Two minutes, Rudy. Okay. Well, in Emmen, we are focusing on uh, PET, we have many PET uh, plants in Emmen, 
Uh, and of course, PET can be recycled very well, make new yarns out of it for all kinds of applications. Uh, actually, you can make PET also bio-based or um, make a bio-based material called PET, which resembles PET a lot. Uh, so PET is both in the bioeconomy and in the technical economy, a very promising material to do all kinds of research. And also um, PLA or is actually also a polyester you can make bio-based, of course, but you can also make fibers out of it for uh, carpets or whatever. So last subjects, biocomposites. We started producing biocomposites together with our students to produce a solar boat made from uh, uh, a resin in combination with uh, hemp uh, fibers. And that proce process continued to applications in water facings, water bearings. We actually produced a bridge for the zoo in Emmen. It's a more yeah, high tech application. Uh, we are working now on a bridge of 60 meters for bicycles, also made out of biocomposites. And most recent, we uh, developed together with student, students a biocomposite tiny house. And here, all kinds of different biocomposites are combined. So, well, uh, the technical loop I will do very quickly. Of course, recycling of plastics is important. The most important areas there are washing of plastic waste and uh, sorting and there we use the newest techniques hyperspectral cameras to distinguish all the different kinds of plastics which are uh, included in plastic waste and you can even uh, identify different kinds of pp from different uh, producers so that's a very promising technique in which you also can distinguish additives which are used so sorting of plastic weights comes to a more high-tech level. And last, of course, when you have recycled materials, you have to find applications and we have a laboratory, a product design laboratory in which we develop all kinds of new products from uh, recycled uh, plastics. So to end, um, when we want to make the transition to a bio-based economy, uh, education is very, very important. So we have developed all kinds of special programs um, in the field of plastics, recycling of plastics, bio-based plastics uh, for our students. So these minor pro programs are half a year uh, and we have a nice, um, well, outline of all kinds of different uh, courses sustainable circular plastics bionics composite design solutions circular startup when you want to start uh, a company and last but not least we have a master program in, in polymer engineering okay i think the 10 minutes are past now so thank you very much for your attention thank you really very well timed um a lot is happening in Emma. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Applications. It's, it's very nice to see. Let's have a panel discussion. Let's see. I have some questions here. And the first one that I see is for um, Harriet. And the question is, what are the bottlenecks for recycling? Um, yeah. Um, the bottlenecks for recycling. Um, well, I think I, I can answer that, but I think it's also uh, good to uh, ask <laughs> Rudy because they are also active in uh, in the development of the recycling processes. Yes. Well, bottlenecks, if you collect, is of, of course that many of the plastics are, are dirty or they are mixed up with other plastics. And as Rudy just uh, showed, um, technology is developed to actually um, uh, separate the plastics much better than, than we could previously, so that's very important. Uh, also important is that when you use plastics and you, you, you keep them in the sunlight, for, for instance, uh, slowly the, the polymers will degrade, so you cannot keep on recycling and recycling. In the end, you, uh, the polymers have degraded so much that you don't have any properties anymore. Uh, and that's the reason why, for instance, the chemical recycling that, um, that we are working on and Emery is also working on is so important because then you can really go back to your original uh, building blocks and rebuild the polymer to have a good property again. 
Yes, maybe in addition, uh, like Harriet said, uh, sorting and washing is important. Um, because when you recycle plastics and you have a mixture, the mechanical properties will go down very quickly. So you must obtain all the different plastics out of the waste. So sorting techniques are very important. Uh, but, some, but some products, it's very difficult to do this because, for instance, in packaging, you have multi-layer of plastics, sometimes 10 or sometimes 14 kinds of different layers, and you cannot separate them again. So that, that's a big issue in recycling of, for instance, plastic uh, packaging. And chemical recycling, uh, in Emmen actually is new pilot plant in which uh, polyester is chemically recycled. So using some kind of process, go back to the monomers, filter out all of the dirt and then repolymerize to new uh, virgin plastic actually. So that's promising, but the research is how much energy does it cost to chemical recycle uh, uh, the plastic. So you must optimize this process to become obtain a good um, business case for uh, recycling these plastics. Okay, thank you. Let's see, the next question I have is uh, one for uh, Firpi. And it's, um, it says, can these products also be made from other sources of biomass? And if so, why did you choose to make them from wood? That's an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, our project is, is, is from, uh, from the wood industry so that's why I my all of my examples were that makes sense were, were from um, from wood but of course they can be as 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 the previous uh, presenter for me um, before me showed that that these these uh, products can be made of of other biomass as well um, what what speaks for wood of course is that um, Especially in Finland, we, as most of the wood is certified, so we can point out that, that um, it's, a, it's a, a sustainable material and, and we can trace it all the way back to the, to the woods. And all, of course, it's, uh, it's also, it's very easy to recycle, so there's a lot of market for um, recycled wood, wood fiber. So we can use that for different purposes. So yep. those, those might be the best reasons. And of course, wood, it gives us other benefits, provides us other benefits as well. If, it, if it's taking good care of, um, it, it can, especially now when, when with the time of Corona, people have understood the value of, of woods um, in Corona so, times, you mean? Yeah, well, if people go into woods here in Finland when, when they can't go anywhere else. Course, they ah, okay, go yes. the yeah, so it's, it, ha it has become very popular. Uh, and the woods are very crowded at the moment, it, it, uh, especially in Lapland. You can see lots of people hiking and being outside and enjoying the nature. So, oh, quite understandable. Many benefits. Eh? Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. I have a question here which is uh, slightly related. Um, it's posed to Rudy, Rudy but I think um, the others can also uh, contribute. Uh, it says, does any, can any biomass be converted to uh, bioplastics as long as they have carbon? Or, and, and does the base material influence the characteristics of the end products? Well, maybe theoretically it's possible but uh, it's not the aim, of course, because uh, also when you uh, synthesize biopolymers, you uh, need energy. So uh, you have to look for natural feedstocks, which is more obvious to uh, use as a, a biopolymer. Um, but with regard to biocomposites, for instance, um, we talked about wood, mostly uh, small fibers. But you can also use long fibers uh, from hemp or jute or flax and then modify the properties of your biopolymer. So that's, yes, I think the uh, benefit of composites, the words already said, you compose the material. And depending on the application, you can use different uh, biopolymers and different uh, fibers to produce a product. 
Yeah, I like Arieto. to add something. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Can, can you use all the biomass components? Yes, in principle you can. But I think it's important uh, to look at a crop and at the function of the different ingredients that are in the crop. Uh, I explained that there are uh, um, proteins there, starch and sugars and, and, and cellulose, etc. And especially proteins and also fat and oils, they are very important for our food. Uh, so the approach that you could take is you have a crop and then you separate the proteins, uh, you bring that to the food industry and then you are left with, with starch, for instance. And starch is an ideal uh, feedstock to produce all kinds of building blocks. Uh, as Rudy said, it takes not much energy because you can uh, get it out of the plant quite pure, you don't need to, uh, to clean. Uh, and so the, the approach is you, you, you look at a crop and then you decide which of the, the ingredients you're going to bring to which market. Uh, and there you can play with sustainability of the whole system. So this is a very important approach. All right. Well, Harriet, I have one, uh, one for you. It's a bit of a long one, so bear with me. <laughs> How would you assess the magnitude of the contribution of bioplastics as a replacement for fossil-based products? to the solution of the entire climate issue. So below the line, is it worth investing in? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm a, presently, I'm also working on a, on a project which we call Challenge Fossil Free. And that, that's, of course, the basic question here. We, we use uh, a fossil feedstock, uh, for oil, uh, coal, gas, etc., mainly for the production of energy and a little bit for the production of materials. Uh, and in order to fight climate change, you have to replace everything, basically. So that means you have to uh, replace the uh, uh, energy applications. Uh, and there is, of course, a lot going on there with using uh, solar energy, water energy, wind energy, etc. So all those solutions, they are not carbon based. And where you do need carbon is in the materials uh, part of, of the applications. And therefore we link uh, uh, the bioplastics development, especially to the material part, so the, the, where you use uh, fossil oil to produce plastics and materials that we, that we see around us. So it's part of the solution, but you have to do everything, I think. Do the other presenters agree with this or have something to add maybe? Yes, I think biopolymers, maybe at the moment it's a small market, uh, but for the long run, uh, bioplastics is a good uh, solution, but it's not the only solution. When we talked about recycling of plastics, uh, I think worldwide, maybe 10 or 12 percent of the plastics is recycled. In the Netherlands, it's between the 30 and 40 percent. And there we can make big steps, I think, to maybe 80% and our government wants 100% in 2050. But when you look at the amount of plastics, it's at the moment much more than the bio-based ones. So on the short run, I think recycling of plastics, we can also make big steps with regard to our carbon footprint and uh, use of plastics because it's a fantastic material. We cannot do without it. I quite agree. Okay, the next question is for Virpi. Um, how sustainable is the, uh, is, is the approach uh, since trees uh, are harvested in, in making the process? So what plants, uh, what plants are there for planting and replacing the harvested uh, trees? Uh, well, currently in Finland, uh, there, the trees, uh, trees grow more uh, than they, they are harvested. So of course, you need to need to um, be sustainable in 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 forestry, and uh, this is also something that we we are trying to communicate to the of course the consumers at that that how how the forests are maintained and and uh, and so uh, for example if you cut down the down a tree you will plant four or five to to replace it so so um, uh, of course uh, the whole value chain needs to be sustainable but uh, at least current currently uh, you know it's it's most of as i mentioned 90 percent of our forests are certified so so in that sense we can communicate this and and the other uh, benefit is that uh, employment uh, issue so it it can employ people uh, in such places um, around our country where no other jobs are available. So, 
Mm. That way it, it produces lots of other benefits as well. And of course, uh, we are worried about the added value of, of, of our products. So we are trying to increase the value in the wood-based products uh, all the time. And uh, so um, there, I, I didn't show, but we have lots of uh, like high-tech applications. It's uh, for um, uh, medicine, for example. Uh, you can make some extracts of, of wood uh, that will solve, um, for example, prostate problems. And then uh, there are wood is used for casts, like replacing, you know, other materials. So th that's more sustainable and more actually friendly, uh, also uh, safe for the for the people working in medicine. So they they are not exposed to harmful chemicals. When, when they are forming the casts. And, and so there are lots of applications that are really, you can justify uh, the use of wood instead of uh, fossil-based plastics, for example. So, yeah. but we try to add value. And of course the textile industry, that's a big uh, end user and it will be, it can be justified uh, to, to, uh, to use uh, wood for, for a clothes, manufacture, manufacturing clothes in the future. Can you explain to, uh, to the attendees how clothes can be, make from, can be made from wood? Well, I'm not a chemist, but, but there are, at, at least in Finland, there are many applications now where, where they are uh, coming to the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, co uh, cotton, to, re to pre replace cotton, uh, uh, because, um, you know, far farming cotton or producing cotton, it's very harmful for the environment. So, so in that manner, wood-based fiber uh, for textile fibers, it's it's much, much more sustainable option. Yeah, I, I can add something to that. So what, what you actually can do is you can dissolve cellulose to make viscose. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And that's already a really old process and that is also not so clean. So uh, there's quite a lot of development has been going on uh, well, the last well, maybe 20 years or maybe even longer uh, to uh, improve the, the footprint of this process. So to use uh, a, a cleaner solvent in order to dissolve the cellulose. And actually in the Bloom project we made a really nice film of this. Uh, which is, was made by the people from, from Austria. So that should be available from the web website. And it explains uh, quite clearly how you can make uh, a t-shirt from a tree. Yeah. In Holland, we make shoes of wood called wooden shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they work quite well, actually. <laughs> okay, I have a question for Rudy here. Uh, let's see. Are you also working on the degradation of uh, PET? For example, how to control the degradation process, or is the main focus there on uh, recycling? Well, normal PET does not uh, degrade uh, in a biological way. So, uh, well, PLA is a kind of polyester. And of course, we are studying also the Wageningen University, uh, the biodegradation behavior. It depends, of course, on the kind of bacteria you use, the temperature and the humidity. Uh, and like I said in my talk, you maybe can also modify the degradation behavior by adding another biopolymer. So influence, influencing uh, the biodegradation behavior. And of course, also natural fibers uh, can adapt or uh, modify the biodegradation behavior because, well, um, these fibers often contain a little uh, water or other bacteria and they can induce uh, also uh, biodegradation. Okay. Uh, let's see. I have another one for you, Rudy. Okay. Uh, let's see. What sort of materials are used in these uh, water-facing biocomposites? Um, are they also renewable or are they uh, recycled materials? Yes, well actually uh, talking about biocomposites, but also normal composites, uh, there are all kinds of uh, composites with different uh, mechanical properties. And actually uh, the picture I showed about the water facings, it's more low-end composites. So it's made of um, uh, grass fibers. 
So when uh, you have grass, you can dry these kinds of fibers. Actually, all the, the biofibers are uh, containing cellulose, so you can all use uh, all kinds of cellulose uh, fibers. But actually, this water facing was made out of uh, grass fibers in combination with a starch-based polymer. So our first water facing poles uh, degraded uh, already in the true three weeks time. So that was not a good <laughs> application for these water faces. But now we have a version 3.0 and it lasted for a longer time. Well, there's a, there's a good point. I mean, biodegradability is, is one thing, but it needs to be timed, obviously. That's right. Yes. Let's see. I have a question here for uh, all three of you. And again, it's a bit of a long one. So here we go. Uh, how soon do you see the alternative uh, based packaging materials um, to be taken on board by big companies such as Amazon, um, as, you know, as they have grown even bigger during the whole Corona pandemic? and the amount waste it is generating as a company. Um, are companies selling their bio-based packaging solutions to Amazon or can they be convinced to change their packaging or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I to go first. To talking uh, about uh, introducing um, recycled plastics or bio-based plastics or the packaging industry, it's a combination of uh, education, uh, politics, uh, and marketing, because often uh, package, packaging is used for marketing um, issues, and that's a difficult one. Um, so, yes, it's a combination. Uh, politics can influence also the use of uh, packaging um, and get a refund, for instance, for bottles or bags or whatever. So, it's difficult to say it will last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Yeah, politics is, is true. Um, in the Netherlands, we also have a, a tax system on, on packaging. Uh, and at present, it is not effective to actually really support the introduction of, uh, of bio-based uh, packaging. So that's really a pity. Um, but I also saw in, uh, I mean, we've been working on this for like 25 years. And a couple of years ago, one of the big retailers in the Netherlands, uh, Albert Heijn, and also some others, they decided to start packing their uh, organic uh, fruit and vegetables, etc., in, in bioplastics, biodegradable plastics. And something like that really helps. Um, but on the other hand, as I already showed, many of the materials uh, are very difficult to distinguish bioplastics from normal plastics. So that's also one of the reasons why we are doing this project. I mean, if we as a public, as a general public, uh, ask for more sustainable solutions, uh, and we know that they are out there, uh, we can help influence also big companies like, uh, like in the end, also Amazon to change yeah. their, um, uh, yeah, to, to change their packaging systems. All right. Yeah. I, so, yes, go yeah, ahead. Uh, I was presenting, my sli last slide was about that, or from that survey we run for Finnish consumers in last February. And what we found out in that study compared to five or ten years back was that uh, the amount or the share of consumers that um, consider uh, sustainability in their everyday choices that had, had increased quite a lot actually. It was like one in three uh, maybe ten years back and now it was almost 45% uh, of consumers considered this issue. So how, how does it could do harm for me or does it promote my well-being, how ethical and sustainable it is, and, and what does it do for the environment. So these are the things the consumer, consumers consider when they make their everyday choices. And, uh, and uh, I think the consumers are a huge driver uh, for the industry uh, to change, change their, uh, their uh, packaging and uh, of course the consumers need information also because uh, uh, regarding bio-based materials or pro especially plastics they don't have information at all also they don't know actually actually how how the material performs and what does it how, what kind of goods you can use it at and and what where you still need maybe 
traditional, more traditional um, uh, materials. One interesting study I, I saw a few years back in a packaging conference by Norwegians was that they were uh, packing some goods, for example, uh, uh, fresh uh, uh, vegetables and, and fruit. And uh, for some people, they put a sticker on top of the packed uh, uh, fruit saying, I'm packed so that my shelf life is extended. And then the other people didn't see that sticker. And once they added the sticker, you know, the preference for the packed uh, fruit was much higher because co the consumers were informed that why, pack it, why the packaging is there. Because, you know, we know that fruit and vegetables, that's the, like one of the categories that there's most food, food loss and, and uh, waste in retail. So, so once the people know why it's there, then it's easier to to uh, um, accept. So I think this is something that we should do all the time. Uh, not forget uh, to educate the consumers that why we pack, even why, 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 packing, why packaging is there. And uh, another thing that I have learned from our studies is that people are not willing to sacrifice the functional properties of packaging for sustainability. So if it's takeaway packaging or something that it fails at its uh, you know, the main purpose, which is to protect the food and make the food uh, uh, eatable. Uh, and if it fails in that manner, so it will spill or it will do something else, the consumers won't buy that package again. So it needs to function, even though it's more sustainable. Goody, Harriet, do you have anything to add to that? No, I just agree. <laughs> it's yeah, true. I agree completely. It, uh, <laughs> it's why we do this, the, this project. Huh? It's to inform yeah to get uh, consumers informed basically yeah well um it's a nice way to end because looking at the time we need to wrap up so uh, thank you very much uh, all three of you for this uh, discussion you're welcome welcome <laughs> i will quickly jump back to sharing my screen let's see um i have some um messages for you um, I would like to invite all of you to uh, have a look uh, later at the... Uh, oh no, wait, I'm, I'm skipping one thing, I'm sorry. We have one more Menti uh, to go. And this is for our information actually, so the, the info won't jump up on the screen, but we would really like to know what you have learned today. So if you would like to go to menti.com again and uh, use the code uh, 942840 which is also in the chat, I think. And you can answer that simple question. What have you learned today? It's a simple question, may not be such a simple answer. Maybe it is, but it will be a great help. Um, let's see, another thing that I want to tell you is, um, I want to invite you to have a look later at the dialogue uh, forum. You can see it uh, below in the screen here. Um, again, the, the link will be in the chat. And in this uh, dialogue forum on the Bloom website, you can continue the discussion and later find answers to the questions, the many questions that I was not able to ask all the panelists uh, today. And uh, let's see, secondly, um, oh yes, please fill in the feedback forms that we would really like to uh, uh, receive from you. It would be um, a great help if we, if we get those. Um, well, that's it, I think. That leaves only my great thanks to the panelists uh, of today, uh, the team involved, of course, in organizing the webinar, and um, you all as attendees, obviously. And I hope to see you at the next webinar, which will be on October 6th, uh, organized by the German-Austrian hub. And the subject will be, let's see, out of fossils into and uh, it is a check of the products from renewable raw materials. So, um, goodbye and stay safe. <laughs>